Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet since April of 2014. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've also lost around 80 pounds. I've completely turned my health around. Haven't you lost more than 80 pounds? Actually, yeah, I've lost a little bit more than that, but we'll talk about that later. All right. Well, this show is a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis. I'm a firm believer in that. (laughs) (laughs) And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nope, 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 nope. And we've done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and mm. the science behind them. We hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite research supporting any claims that we make. And you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Sure are. We love to cook and we love to eat. Mm. In every episode, we both share a keto recipe that cannot be denied. Deny it? I did. Deny it. (laughs) So, let's start podcast number 85, Catching Up with Gary Taubes. So, Richard, do we have anything to say about last week's show? Uh, Last week's show, that was uh, the uh, Obesity Code podcast. That's right. Yeah, the pilot. Yeah, we've had such a lot of comments about that. We had a few negative ones. Some people didn't like the music, yep. but we've had hundreds of comments of people saying that they enjoyed uh, the podcast and a mm-hmm. couple of people were brought to tears by it. Yeah. Yeah. It was really good. So, you know, this is a, it's a work in progress. We'll adjust as we mm-hmm. go along and we're really appreciative for all the feedback that we got. Absolutely. So let's revisit what a ketogenic diet is. A ketogenic diet is low-carb, moderate protein, high fat. For us, low-carb means 20 grams or less of carbohydrates per day. Yeah, and for me, that really has to be below 10 grams a day. And everybody's going to be different, but uh, under 20 will get most people into ketosis. That's right. And uh, moderate protein, that's one Mm -hmm. to one and a half grams of protein a day for every kilogram of lean body mass that you have. That's whatever... Your weight is minus your body fat. And then the rest of our energy we get from fat. (laughs) The fat on your plate or the fat from that Krispy Kreme donut you ate a decade ago. (laughs) So, Richard, how was your week, man? Yeah, it was actually good. I've been fasting sort of Monday and Tuesday every week for the the past two months. It was something Mm. that when I got back from America, I found out that Julie, who'd never fasted beforehand, never done any extended fasts beforehand, Mm -hmm. um, had spontaneously done on her own while I was away and she did a two-day fast and found it wasn't any problem for her. So by the time I got back, she said to me, look, I want to do fasts more often. And uh, so I said, fine, let's do it. And so she wanted to try the, you know, a fast for two days and she wanted to eat no food. You know, we started originally, we were just having like a a bone broth, but uh, after the first couple of weeks, she's she's on a water fast and uh, and I am too. And uh, so every Monday and Tuesday uh, for the past two months, I've uh, been water fasting, which has been awesome. Awesome. And- at the end of the this week, on Wednesday, after my two-day water fast, uh, I actually went a third day. So after a three-day water fast, um, I was the lowest weight that I have been since I was 22 years old. Oh, and wow. that was coincidentally also my 52nd birthday. So that's the lowest weight that I've been in 30 years. And how much weight have you lost now? Uh, yeah, entirely 94.6 pounds. Wow. Uh, it's 43 kilograms. So, wow. um, you know, it, it's been very slow for the past um, uh, probably exactly three years, about this time three years ago. Right. I, I'd finished all my major major fast weight loss and then I mm. sort of um, hit what people call a plateau, but I've just been slowly inching down ever since and, and – yep. um, I believe that that has a lot to do with just slowly reducing my insulin resistance as mm-hmm. I slowly replace 
fat because, yeah. as we know, fat lives for about 10 years and you lose about 10% of your adipose tissue or your, your adipocytes uh, every year uh, will uh, die and be replaced by new ones. And yeah. so in the past three years, almost 30% of my adipocytes um, are never new being in a diabetic body. So they're yeah. nascent, they have no experience with it. So, so that's part of how um, you, the weight loss happens after your initial uh, big drop. Well, congratulations on losing all that weight, man. That's uh, Yeah, thanks. It's fantastic and it must feel awesome. Yeah, and so how much have you lost and uh, and how was your week? Oh, okay. Well, you know, I've first of all, I had a great week. I was at a, a Microsoft conference in Orlando called Ignite. Nice. And you know what's in Orlando? Yeah. Texas de Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> sort of like meat eaters paradise. Anyway, yeah. I have been at the same weight. Like I've lost 80 pounds and I pretty much stayed there for over a year. And right. yeah, it's interesting that people say, you know, when are you going to lose more weight? When are you going to lose more weight? Well, you know, I've just been enjoying my relationship to food and I yeah. have been eating more than I probably should. Mm. And, but it's just been so nice to not be sick and yeah. to not be hungry all the time and to eat what I want. And it, it's sort of like the new normal and no diabetes, no heart yeah. disease, like I feel great. I don't have any aches and pains. I have no stiffness. Nice. I'm, I've got lots of energy. Yeah. So, you know, I'm just coasting. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting is that most people who diet rebound and they go back to the same weight again. And, you know, it's remarkable that you can eat pretty much what you want, ad libitum, yep. and you're not putting on that 80 pounds again, which yeah. is remarkable. So even though people say, you know, I'm annoyed that I'm not continuing to lose weight. Mm. Um, there is a lot to be said for the fact that you can uh, uh, live a very good life and not go back to where you were. Right. Well, you know, most people get psychologically depressed and defeated when they stop losing weight. Mm. And I just am not that guy. I just am. <laughs> I, I, I'm counting my blessings here, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I know that uh, – I know that – it just takes a little modification of behavior to uh, to move to the next level or just waiting it out, like you said, mm -hmm. letting yeah. your adipocytes die off and your insulin sensitivity come back. But that brings me into what my plan is for next week. I'm going to try sure. an another five-day fast. To tell you the truth, I feel like I'm addicted to fasting. And I don't know if this is healthy or not, but I mm. love the feeling of being fasted. Yeah. That after day two. Oh, yeah. After day two. And I mm. would say it starts for me on day two. Day one is, you know, mm, yeah, eh, nah. um, but day two and onward, uh, and, and I never stop fasting because I'm hungry. Mm. I stop fasting because of some, you know, social engagement, you know, dinner with my family, something, you know, we have dinner out, go to a party, whatever. And I'm like, eh, okay, it's time to stop. But right. to tell you the truth, it feels so good. <laughs> I just want to continue. Yeah. So going five days next week, I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah. Awesome. So this is the portion of the show where we give away a piece of swag to one lucky member of the Two Keto Dudes fan club. And today we're giving away, guess what? <laughs> a coffee mug. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and today's winner is Mark Valdiva. Yeah, Mark. Well done, Mark. <laughs> well done. And uh, Mark won that just by signing up for the Two Keto Dudes fan club, which you can do by going to fanclub.twoketo.com. You just answer literally four or five questions. And now we have your email address and your name, and, and we will contact you if you're picked randomly to win. Nice. And if you want to get some of that gear, uh, but you don't want to wait until you win it, uh, you can always go to gear.twoketo.com. And uh, you can you can buy a mug with our mugs on it. Sure, absolutely. Well, Richard, that brings us to the very special part of our podcast we call Man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I never get tired of that every no. week for eighteen <laughs> months. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll go first. This is actually a private message, but I will not. Uh, read their names just because, you know, they didn't give us permission to talk about, but it's a great story. Okay. Sure. So 
it, the message says, early this year, my wife and I were sluggish and always fatigued and probably on our way to being diagnosed with diabetes since it does run in our families. Mm -hmm. In June, my wife's cousin and his wife came for a visit. Now, please keep in mind, this man at his fittest was always a hefty person. As he walked through my door, I was beside myself. I had known this man for years. I've never seen him this thin, even in pictures of when he was younger. He looked like me when I was in high school. And when wow. I asked how he had lost all that weight, his wife laughed and said, we eat fat. <laughs> <laughs> At first, I dismissed that comment and figured they were pulling my leg. But as they kept talking, I started to make note on certain key phrases such as keto, ketogenic, two keto dudes. <laughs> <laughs> That's us. That's us. Yeah. And later, as I researched what ketogenic was, I found way too much information with no direction. I decided to listen to your very first episode. And although you had started your journey the previous year, it felt as if I was starting right along with you. I spent the rest of that day trying to explain this lifestyle to my wife. And that night she made me spaghetti, so I <laughs> held my ground and went through yeah. the plate, ate the meat, and left the rest. But to answer your question, yes, she was mad. I, I never leave her food on my plate, but she saw that I was serious about this, and I really wanted to give it a try. So I started June 4th, and I lost 20 pounds within the first two weeks without exercising. Nice. Yeah. At first, my wife wasn't doing it with me, but within two weeks, as she saw my results, she hopped on board. Mm -hmm. I had to take the time to thank you guys for the podcast. You gave me enough knowledge to keep us going and be able to answer my wife's questions, but I also have to thank my wife, since her tenacity in searching for recipes has opened up a whole new world of healthy and delicious food for us. We are Hispanic, but mainly eat Italian in our household. Now it's all keto. Since June 4th, I've lost 50 pounds. Well done. Also said goodbye to aching and stiff knees, low energy, and a whole lot of oversized clothes. <laughs> and my wife has lost 30 pounds and still going. We have paid it wow. forward. Her best friend has also lost about 30 pounds. And her and my wife now sit during our kids' karate class and exchange recipes and bring new delicious food to each other. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, that's such a good mail. I'm not going to... Do one. I think that really. Th 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 this is exactly why we did the the two keto dudes podcast in the first yeah. place. Well, maybe the first month we were doing it as a commitment device for you to right. to to give you a reason to um to justify um doing ketogenic diet. Hey, I'm doing it on a podcast. But after the first month or so, um, it was the feedback we were getting from viewers, yeah. uh, or listeners, I should say, um, who were saying, look, I'm, I'm taking on board what you're doing and it's making a major difference for me and now I'm taking it on to other people. That's yep. why we kept doing it. And so for us, really, it is an opportunity to pay forward for the people who taught us and brought us along on this path and yeah. hopefully um, we can uh, influence a few people and uh, help you uh, give your loved ones and family and friends um, a, a useful podcast that they can use as a reference to be able to yeah. to share what you're doing. So thank you for letting us know about that. That's exactly why we're doing what we're doing. Exactly. And, uh, and we love it. So thank you. We want more like that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, well share done. it with your friends and family. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Could you save your due for a little? Well, we are very excited to finally have on the show, almost embarrassing that it's taken this long, uh, Mr. Gary Taubes. Gary is an investigative science and health journalist, co-founder of the nonprofit Nutrition Science Initiative at NUSI.org. He's the author of The Case Against Sugar, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, and Good Calories, Bad Calories, published as The Diet Delusion in the UK. And uh, there's more, but Gary, you also wrote a book called Bad Science, right? I did write a book called Bad Science. Uh, my sort of uh, I introduction to this kind of research uh, is was writing books about uh, scientists who screwed up because it helps to know how easy it is for scientists to screw up, how easy it is sure. to get the wrong answer so that you could then understand what's happened in nutrition. And really how easy it is for bad science to permeate throughout popular culture, especially 
for people who are in charge of making decisions based on it. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, bad science may be the norm. Actually, it may have always been the norm. It may have been kind of like movies. You know how we think <laughs> there was some great era of movies because you look back and yeah. say, wow, the 70s was like the godfather, you know? But then there was all the crap that we forget about that was made <laughs> with the 70s. And the same thing could be true for science where you forget about the crap and the mistakes and the thousands of researchers who are doing, you know, mediocre or worse work and you only remember, you know, the Niels Bohr's and the Francis Crick's and people like that. So, in this case, yeah. the, the mediocre guys won. Right. So, that's, that's, the, that's the issue. By the way, thank you for having me on your show. It's great to, you know, finally be here. We're almost embarrassed that we didn't have you on before, but, you know, it's just a matter of meeting up and, you know, finding a way to do that. Uh, but we're, we're honored to have you, aren't we, Richard? Yeah, absolutely. I think that specifically bad science in the era of uh, nutritional policy is bad science that can be compounded to to cause dramatic damage to the to, to all of us. I mean, I'm a, here I am a type two diabetic, and uh, you know I've personally suffered from <laughs> some of that bad science. Well, this is one of the problems: is when you invoke bad science in public health, or the, the American Medical Association, the American Heart Association, takes this stuff on. It's hard to back out of it once you've started giving recommendations that may be wrong. Yeah. It's hard to ever acknowledge that. You know, like, are we supposed to send apology notes to the millions of people around the world who may have taken our low-fat diet advice and, you know, sort of accelerated their deaths by doing so? And... So you could kind of get in legal trouble if you acknowledge an error like that, too. Like, if you have good lawyers, they're telling you, hey, wait a minute, let's just back off the we're sorry we screwed <laughs> up letter. Right. And just, why don't we just sort of slowly move into giving the right advice and pretend we were giving the right advice all along, and that way we may not have the kind of issues we have if you actually acknowledge that you did far more harm than good. So, oh, yeah. man. It's like turning around a large ocean liner at sea, you know, it's it's easier if you just take small little incremental steps. And uh, in, I know with public policy here in Australia, our version of, I guess, of the NIH is uh, an organisation called the CSIRO, the Commonwealth Science in Industry and Research Organisation. And they've been releasing diet books every five years for the last 20 years. And every point, they make a slight adjustment. And they basically have a low-carb book. It's not high saturated fat or, or it's not releasing the inhibition on saturated fat. That's that's leaving something to, to put in the book in five years' time. <laughs> you know. Well, you know, I find it particularly hard to convince doctors and not only doctors, you know, to just look at science and just look at the latest science. It's hard to convince them to even look at it. Mm. But I find that family members are the last people on earth who are going to admit that you know something that either they don't know or their doctors don't know. And, you know, when you when you come out with some of this stuff, they look at you like, how could my brother-in-law know more about this stuff than all these people who have been telling me all these facts for so long, right? When, I mean, the truth is that's usually a pretty good bet, right? Because if you were spouting off about nuclear engineering or, I don't know, even car repair, it's quite <laughs> likely that they would say, look, the guys on car talk know better, even if <laughs> right. they've passed away. Yeah. They've got to, right? <laughs> That's. A, I often wonder if, um, yeah, if my mother was still alive, whether she would <laughs> buy anything I was saying or whether she <laughs> would keep telling me what they say and they right. would be, you know, these sort of vague people who's show up under the, the term scientists or researchers in newspaper articles. Well, if my mother was your mother, she'd say, you know, I read your book and it's very interesting, but you got to eat your vegetables. Stop eating that <laughs> fat. That's why I do eat my vegetables. In all honesty, all the research aside, and I know that the official wisdom on this is that the essence of a healthy diet is uh, fruits and vegetables on the plate. I never actually found in all my research, I never particularly found any good science to back that up, any, any meaningful evidence, but I eat a lot of green vegetables because my mother told me to yeah, eat green right. vegetables when I was younger <laughs> and... You know, can yeah. it possibly? Do? When I first got into this research back in the late '90s for this uh, this investigative piece I did on the journal Science, that I spent a year doing this article on dietary fat, and I remember at the end of it, I don't know, 
this made it into the final copy, but I was quoting one of the le world's leading researchers on dietary fat and nutrition. He was saying, look, if we just say that the only thing we have any confidence in is that you should eat your green vegetables, people might wonder, why Why have we done all this work? Wasn't our mothers telling us that, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, exactly. $2 billion ago? <laughs> yeah. So, I know this is probably the 90,000th time somebody's talked to you about your last book, The Case Against Sugar, which came out admittedly last year. So, you've had a lot of time to promote it. But there are still people I know out there that listen to the show that may have heard about some of the corruption with the sugar business in the, in the you know, t decades ago, and uh, but, but didn't read the book. So, uh, I'm just, you know, let's, let's shock them. <laughs> well, you know, I was actually going to bring this up about our last point, so I'm not going to shock them at the first. But what's fascinating to me about this, so with the help of this uh, extraordinary young researcher named Kristen Kearns, actually she did all the work, I just got to take some of the benefits. She had dug up uh, basically the publicity plan that the sugar industry used through their, their arm, the Sugar Association, to... Uh, convince the scientific community or to help convince the scientific community because I'm not sure they needed convincing and that's the point that dietary fat was the problem and the all our woes and that there was just nothing unique you could say about sugar that would uh, you know implicate it in being a unique cause of obesity or diabetes mm. Um, so I wrote about this in the book and Kristen published an article with her colleagues at UC San Francisco on this last fall that then made it into the front page of the New York Times that basically explained how the sugar industry had paid researchers at Harvard something like $50,000, which was a huge sum at the time, to write the series of articles saying that dietary fat is a cause of chronic disease and that sugar is benign. Mm. Um, now, I don't think they had to pay him much because these guys legitimately believed that dietary fat was the cause of all our heart disease right. and obesity and that sugar was benign. But the funny thing is, so for the last 15 years, I've been writing articles and books about how the nutrition uh, research community just missed the point. They obsessively focused on fat and they yeah. basically gave sugar a free pass and yep. because they gave it a free pass and you had to make these low fat foods and you needed to make the low fat foods taste good so you dumped yeah. high fructose corn <laughs> syrup in which is another form of sugar. So mm. it's just bad science, bad science, bad science. Now, the research community says, oh, wait a minute. Suddenly, it's like, we know why we screwed up. The sugar industry was <laughs> corrupt. And they paid our, you know, researchers yeah. to publish stuff. And like, and so the implication is, so they, they leap on this corruption idea because it suddenly excuses the fact that for 50 years, they missed the point. Right. P poor Frederick Stair was so led us, led us astray by the sugar yeah. industry. <laughs> yeah. And like it was, you know, they, if they hadn't been so corrupt, we would have gotten the right answer. And I'm going, wait, no, <laughs> no, no, no. You guys were getting the wrong answer anyway. They just paid you to sort of ride that yeah. wave with them so yeah and that was just one force i mean it, you think about the grain industry in the united states and everything that's behind that we talking to gary fetke about the origins of our dietary guidelines and where they go back before ansel keys before you know he he was relatively you know later 10 years later before john kellogg and the seventh day adventists you know were were pushing grains well, this is the thing. I also, the, the, you know, they had this, um, coming out of the 1930s, the nutrition community knew that they, you could get vitamin deficiency diseases if you ate unbalanced diets. They didn't know how to define a balanced diet. Nobody really ate a balanced diet back then anyway, because yeah. fruits and green vegetables are often very hard to come by. But they knew that if you sure. ate a very unbalanced diet and you lived on basically refined grains alone, you would get these vitamin deficiency diseases like pellagra or uh, uh, beriberi or scurvy. So, 
in the 1940s, led by f the infamous Fred Stair and the Harvard School of Public Health, they thought, how do we avoid getting deficiency diseases? How do we avoid an unbalanced diet? Well, let's eat a little bit of everything. And this was the beginning of the concept also, the balanced diet. So, and the, the major food groups, I think Harvard had seven food groups mm. and then the <laughs> U.S. God. Department of Agriculture honed it down to four food groups but the other idea was each of these food groups you could sell every industry would get a little piece of the pie actually the sugar industry was left out of that when they were a little pissed about that but you know that <laughs> revenge is as they say sweet <laughs> sweet exactly yeah i mean wait i have a good line coming that was spontaneous and you interrupted oh, I'm me i'm sorry but, i stole your thunder you know. I mean, think about it, that the, the, you know, America the Beautiful is amber waves of grain. Absolutely. It's not amber waves of broccoli or amber <laughs> waves of cauliflower. It's amber waves of grain. That's what we sell. That's yeah. what the Great Plains is all about. And the so fruited plains. You have to include that. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, that was the... Uh, they, Never any really good science behind this. It was just a lot of sort of what seemed like common sense. Mm. But the problem is, you know, I think it was Voltaire who said common sense is not all that common. Or, and science is about often demonstrating that what we think is obvious is not. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So, long story short, yeah, we have been led astray in a number of ways. And the, the sugar industry was just one part of it. The sugar industry was, again, was just taking advantage of what the bad nutrition and obesity researchers gave them and you know it still is it's very funny I, it's not funny it's kind of tragic so here in san francisco i live in oakland across the bay from san francisco and right. they tried to pass a law saying that uh you have to label sugary beverages as being contributors to obesity and diabetes i think the terminology sure. was relatively benign because saying it contributes to it is like I don't know, not particularly damning <laughs> accusation because oh, you pretty, could say broccoli contributes to it. Pretty inaccurate. Anyway, yeah. yeah, so the sugar industry, the beverage industry went to court to try and stop this labeling and they lost in the first court and then they appealed and they just won the appeal. And they won the appeal basically because of this idea that Diabetes is caused by obesity, and obesity is caused by eating too many calories of all types. It's an energy balance disorder. This is my, <laughs> this is my white whale, my Moby Dick, the thing I'm obsessed with in life, like mm -hmm. Ahab, and I'm going to go <laughs> down with it. But it's this idea that, you know, we get fat just because we take in too many calories. And yeah. so the only way that a food can influence our weight is by its caloric content. Right. And once again, the sugar industry won because we have this sort of inanely simplistic idea of obesity, kind of like saying somebody gets wealthy because they make more money than they spend. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> and that's our theory of obesity. People get fat because they take in more energy than they expend. And we, because of that, the sugar industry continues to sort of, you know, march off unimpeded, except by the, 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 the public is finally catching on. But um, mm. it's incredible, really, because uh, I mean, a, a calorie is a physical unit. You know, it, it's, it's what raising uh, a milliliter of water by one degree from 15 Celsius to 16 Celsius or something, the energy required to do that. So, you know, it, it, has, a, it has a very defined term. But how nutritionists and dietitians uh, apply this is, is amazing. I mean, one of the most amazing things to me is the fact that they decided if they put an uppercase uh, C in front of it, then it was obviously a thousand times as potent as if it had a lowercase C in front of it. And it was, mm. it was very sciencey by, by using a unit of a thousand to, to multiply this thing by. So it's almost a, almost a metric measurement. But when it comes down to it, Calories in and calories out does define the flux of, of energy into and out of a system. But what we do with that energy, I mean, the amount, the, the amount of insulin that we have flowing through our body determines how much fat we're going to use, how much fat we're going to liberate into our circulation. It determines how much fat energy we're going to use in our mitochondria. It determines everything about how we're going to use our energy. And these things are not in our control. I mean, you can say to somebody, well, all you need to do is go out and do a bit of exercise, but how many calories they actually use during that day that they do that exercise in is utterly out of their control. You know, it's it's, it's just remarkable. Mm. So it's funny after um 
this here, this this case was decided last week in San Francisco. I got a hold of the uh, the brief that was filed by the city of San Francisco to argue that they should get to have this label, and in it is the expert testimony from their expert witness, who is the most influential nutritionist in the world. Okay, as he himself uh-huh. says in expert testimony, he talks about his 1,500 papers that he's published and that he's about the, the top five most cited scientists in the world. So, in his expert brief, he has this, I'm going to read this because this is his definition of what causes obesity. So, he says, obesity arises as a result of an energy imbalance between calories consumed and calories expended, creating an energy surplus and a state of positive energy balance, which in turn results in excess body weight over time. Okay, so this is the world's leading nutritionist wow. making a sense. And I said, here now, here's the exact, the logical equivalent of that if we're talking about wealth. Right. So I sure. took his sentence and I just made it about wealth instead of obesity. Mm. And th- this is what it says. It's the exact equivalent. <laughs> wealth arises as a result of a money imbalance between dollars earned and dollars spent, creating a money surplus and a state of positive <laughs> money balance <laughs> which in turn results in excess wealth over time. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so clear. There's nothing I'm, about how to get wealthy or how to get poor. Or why <laughs> anyone gets wealthy or why anyone gets poor. And yet, the first <laughs> one is completely conventional wisdom. And what's particularly bizarre to me, like, we can laugh about this. But if I did this exercise, if I ran these lines to the nutrition obesity researchers, they would look at me like I was crazy. Like right. I had just spoken Serbo-Croatian to them and they don't speak Serbo-Croatian. They would not be able to process what I said. And if I emailed it to them, they wouldn't respond. Or if they did respond, they would respond without addressing, because I would like to, I do this all the time, send these things out and say, just explain to me why a statement that is clearly absurd when talking about the accumulation of excess money is somehow right. profound and meaningful right. when talking about the accumulation of excess fat. Yep. And I'm going to make the logic identical, and I simply, it's, the cognitive dissonance is so profound. And maybe I'm crazy, I don't know. That's No, I think uh, that, uh, that's, a, that's an exercise in the English language, being accurate, you know? I, you, would, you would think so. But nonetheless, I exercises like this tend to fail me entirely. So, there is a serious possibility that I'm, not only am I insane, you guys have caught, have been infected <laughs> by this insanity. insanity. <laughs> and if you think you somehow lost weight by dint of understanding yeah, um, right. the basic logic better than the nutrition community does, then you're obviously demented as well. And I'm sure if we really interviewed your family members, we would find out that that you're not a pound <laughs> you know, lighter than you've ever been. It's actually so profound what you just said there with taking that same sentence and making it about money that I would be tempted to print it on a business card, one side yeah. uh, about about weight and obesity and the other side about wealth and just hand it out and say, you know what, study both sides of this and you tell me what you think about calories in, calories out now. <laughs> I mean, it's just well, this is- so profound. Yeah, I, I, I suspect the next time I give a lecture or my Why We Get Fat lecture, I'm going to start with this exercise and then just, it kind of gets to the root of it. It, it makes it a much shorter lecture. <laughs> yeah, right. But, <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't know. I right. sometimes I'm just mystified and I read this stuff and I think, how, how could they have written this sentence? So when I, I, my book was reviewed in the New Yorker by a, professor of medicine at Harvard named Jerome Groupman, who is very well-respected writer. He's a writer, actually, I respected until he reviewed my book. And in oh. my book, he said, <laughs> oh. in my book, he said that, well, how did he phrase it? The importance of calories is one of the few undeniable facts of nutrition research or obesity research. And I thought, and I actually wrote this to the managing editor of the New Yorker. I said, if he had written, th- if this was a piece about economics, and he had written The Importance of Money. It's one of the few uh, <laughs> undeniable facts of, you yeah. know, economics. 
or the importance of dollars, he would have taken it out, right? He said, you yeah. know, we don't have to say Duh. this because it doesn't, it doesn't explain anything. We know <laughs> dollars are important, but thanks, you know. genius. <laughs> and I mean, this guy, he's got a college degree. He said Harvard, he's a smart guy. He's got a long yeah. list of publications. All right. Anyway. Yeah. It's a strange world. So, what else can I do for you guys other than <laughs> ramble about, like, Ahab about the whale? <laughs> so, Gary, uh, I'm interested in the Nutritional Science Initiative. Uh, where does that stand currently? Okay. The Nutrition Science Initiative, uh, which is my not-for-profit that mm. co-founded with uh, Dr. Peter Atia to uh, – basically uh, get the research funded that we think needs to be done to resolve the kinds of controversies that we're talking about. Um, we ran into uh, difficulties about two years ago. Uh, the Peter left, the billionaires who funded us, the Lauren John Arnold Foundation, our, when our funding uh, ran out, they decided in effect that they might be able to do what we do themselves and fund right. research, which indeed they have done. They've now funded one of the studies that we wanted to see get funded and there'll be uh, press releases about that in the near future um, and so we have been sort of coasting along uh, without funding we do this mostly as a hobby um, mm, and mm. Uh, we're still doing what we did, which is try to get uh, research funded. So there's about four projects that I'm actively trying to raise money for. And probably in October, I will start, you know, talking about these more online. Um, a type 2 diabetes project, a type 1 diabetes project. We have proposals for both of those. And then uh, right. nice. uh, a Two other trials that I think the world needs to see that I think could go a long way towards result. Again, it's always aimed at, you know, we have this. I think the world is clearly the story that sugar, if it's not toxic, it's something you should avoid, has been embraced. And that's moving along with or without, mm. you know, Nusi funding. Yeah. Um, this idea that obesity is just not an energy balance disorder, that it's right. a hormonal regulatory disorder, that still needs – I don't think it needs research to support because to me it's just <laughs> clear from the evidence and the yeah. logic. The thing, that I, the thing that I get is that there's been a lot of studies done already, haven't there? You and Nina and people like that have sort of looked at these things and, uh, you know, like it's been proven – but the problem is people aren't listening. Well, you can't really use a word like proven in science because arguably the only thing you could prove in science is mathematics. Um, okay. The, uh, they, it, it's like a, this science, evidence like a Rorschach block. You see into whatever you want to see into it. Yeah. You decide if right. you like a study, that's because it, if a study confirms your preconceptions, you figure out reasons why they did the science particularly well. And if a study refutes your preconceptions, you figure out why they did it badly. And there is pure science though, right? Uh, there is, but it's very hard to do with human beings. You know, yeah. we just screw everything up. We think for ourselves. Yeah. We don't follow instructions. These studies are just really hard to do right. Yeah. And um, they're, that's why we founded Newsy. They're also very expensive to do right. And, you know, there are major issues. Like one is on the health aspects of dietary fats. So right. should we be eating saturated fats or polyunsaturated fats? Uh, the, the research community with the help of Nina and with my help and with the help of others managed to finally get rid of this idea that we should be eating low fat diets. Right. Yeah. But that has been replaced with the idea that we should be eating higher fat diets, but we should, instead of eating saturated fats, we should replace them with polyunsaturated fats. Vegetable oils. Um, yeah. We, yeah. Which in reality means instead of eating foods that we've been eating for millions of years, like butter and animal fats in particular, we should be eating vegetable oils, which are relatively new, yeah. if not kind of brand new inventions uh, in the term of, you know, in the context of human history. Right. So, that's very questionable. The epidemiologists seem to believe that's true based on their research. I think their research is a pseudoscience, so... The question yeah. is, how do you resolve that? How do you 
what kind of studies can you do to say, you know, are we better off eating the kind of animal products we've been eating, you know, ethical and moral issues aside, and environmental yeah. issues aside, should we be eating, you know, mostly animals or mostly plants, mostly animal fats or mostly plant vegetable oils, right. that kind of research to do rights, 50, $100 million per study. Um, so what do you think about just collecting the end of one studies, you know, of, of people, anecdotal evidence of people like Richard and I, what we've done and the people that we know that have easily reversed diabetes, you see the same stories over and over and over again, right? Yeah. And in fact, I'm <laughs> sort of doing that, not actually end of one, I've been interviewing physicians, practitioners lately for my next book to get their stories. The problem is you could find end of one stories that support anything. So this guy, uh -huh. Dr. McDougall has his starch diet, which is basically, mm. as far as I can tell, all potatoes. <laughs> He's oh, right. got yeah. his website is full of super losers who say mm. they've lost 70, 80, 100 pounds or healthy for the first time in their life eating nothing but starches that we yeah. think you should avoid. Yeah. Um, I tend to believe those people. And every one yeah. of them says, oh, I did Atkins and it didn't work and now right. I'm doing the starch diet and it does. You know, there are people who say they gave up meat and now they're healthy for the first time in their life. I yeah. suspect they gave up meat and white flour and sugar and they might be healthier if they just gave up the white chef flour and the sugar and the starches. They need more meat, but we don't know that. For that, you need a study. Sure. So, people yeah. like you, um, it should be enough to convince the world that what you did for yourself is beneficial. But we don't know if what you did is more beneficial than doing something else. Sure. And we don't know if... I did what you did, it would be beneficial for me also. Right, now, yes. in this case, yeah. I did, and it was, but <laughs> if we pick, you know, a random individual on the street. Sure. We see it as a, as a grassroots m movement that will have influence yeah. over people. I mean, we're already seeing the influence of, you know, social media groundswells of uh, people who just, you know, flaunt it. They say, you know, I did exactly what everybody tells me not to do. And I made myself well in every yeah. measurable way. And when well, uh, this is uh, the sort of pr profound, this was one of my revelations doing this research. So about 20 years ago, 1998, Malcolm Gladwell did his very first piece for the New Yorker. I think it was mm. his first piece and it was on obesity. It was called the Pima Paradox. It was, you know, sort of Malcolm at his, you know, ingenious, clever best. And <laughs> in this, he, one of the things he does, he kind of uh, breaks down diet books to show that they all have the same sort of structure. And it is a doctor or physician who's overweight or has some chronic problem and nothing they do can make any difference. And then finally he or she stumbles on diet X and they go on Diet X and they are healthy for the first time in their life. And then they prescribe Diet X to their patients and their patients get healthy. And then they write a book about it. Right. And or first, no, then they come up with some logic to explain why this worked and they write a book. So this seemed very clever. And I was impressed. I remember when I read it 19 years ago. But then when you think about it, you could break the world down into sort of a, especially while there's an obesity and diabetes epidemic going on, you could break the world down into the lean people who are healthy mm. and do the yes. conventional wisdom and have always been healthy. Right. So these people have no reason to question anything. Everything works for them. Sure. They're just fine. End of story. Yep. No revelations are ever going to come out of these people. Then you have the people who have been getting more and more obese and diabetic, and maybe they try everything and nothing works. Right. right. No revelations from them. Or right. maybe they're yeah. not... They just they just think this is the way life is, and they don't try anything, mm. and Fages, they remain yeah. getting fatter and more diabetic. You get no revelations from them. Then finally, you get the people who are smart enough to say, Jesus, I just keep getting fatter and fatter, or my patients just keep getting fatter and fatter, which right. is a story I've mm. gotten from a lot of these doctors. And I went into medicine to make people healthy. You right. know, I, that's why I did it. I don't want to just give drugs and fiddle with people's insulin for the rest of their life. I want to make them healthy. That's why I went into this. So I'm going to sure. look and see if there's anything out there that'll make them healthy. And lo and behold, 
I stumble on this low carb thing, or maybe there are other people who stumble on the vegan thing or the vegetarian thing or the starch thing or right, the Ornish yeah. thing, yeah, yeah. but I stumble on something and it works for me because if I'm a good doctor, I'm not prescribing some weird diet that I think is a fad right. to my patients yeah. before I try it on myself. I try it on myself, I get better, I get healthy. Yeah. I lose weight, my diabetes resolves, whatever, pre-diabetes. The world is full of people like, you know, Sammy Inkinen, at, uh, who started yeah. Verda Health, who's a world-class triathlete, or my former colleague Peter Atia, who was a world-class endurance swimmer, who were right. getting pre-diabetic and obese, try low-carb, they get healthy. So, now you've got yeah. a revelation. Now, you've got the stuff of science. Right. I did yeah. the opposite of what I expected. <laughs> Yeah. This is what science is about. This would move science forward. Absolutely. And now, like I said, if you're a doctor, you're gonna you've got your patients are experiencing the same thing. Cautiously try it on your patients. Yeah. If your patients get healthy, now you're passionate. And, and one of the book. Canadian doctors <laughs> like to say, I've, and one of them, I, I, the first time I heard it was this uh, uh, South African doctor who's now working in Vancouver. And I said, why mm -hmm. are you so passionate about this? He said, because I can't unsee what I've seen. Yes. Right. You know? <laughs> yes. It's like totally. type 2 diabetes is supposed to be irreversible. You're supposed to, like, you put them on oral meds and you get them on insulin. Then you, you know, basically play with their insulin dosing until they eventually... Get their feet chopped off, yeah. Um, and boom, I changed their diet. The diabetes goes away quickly, like a few months. Yeah, yeah they're off yeah. their meds. They're off their. So how do you want to see that? So now you have people who are passionate. Passionate mm -hmm. people want to tell other people about their passion, so they're right, going to write yeah. books. It's like right. what Malcolm wrote and sort of made fun of, and I thought was funny, is actually the only way the world moves forward. But this is. That's Any true. other scenario, uh, you get no yeah. change. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, that's absolutely true. We've been very careful to not give medical advice and to say that everybody yeah. can benefit from a ketogenic diet. There are clearly people that um, shouldn't fast, for example. There are clearly people that uh, have insulin sensitivity, that are fit, that have a good exercise routine, that eat whatever they eat, and they don't have any health issues, that... You know, hmm. maybe they don't need that, but certainly, you know, us, we being middle-aged white guys with type 2 diabetes and obesity, you know, it worked for us. We tend to be careful and say, this is what we did. If that helps you, great. Well, the way I deal with it, which again, you could do if you're a, a writer or a journalist or probably even a doctor, you can't do if you're a public health authority as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. You know, public health organization. I, people say, what should I do? And my books say, what should, do? and I say, well, this is what worked for me. This is what I think the science supports. Yeah. And I think it'll work for you. And I think this is how you should try it. And if it doesn't work and you have a massive heart attack, I apologize. Yeah, right. In advance, because <laughs> again, everything, everything on some level is an experiment. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's there are no guarantees. Right. We get no guarantees. No, I think you've adequately described our passion, though, because that was what happened to us. We found something that worked. We tried it. It, you know, it. We then passed it on to other to our friends and family, and and our audience is just growing because of that. Um, and I mean, that, that really was our passion is the fact that we cannot now unsee this. I yeah. see diabetic people, type two diabetics all the time. And that's the basis of our passion. Mm. Um, so it, you know, as you say, this is how things change. It's, and in our particular instance, what we're trying to do is we're trying to teach the grassroots that type two diabetes doesn't have to be your future. Right. It can be reversed, and there are ways to do it. It worked for us, and and by the and, way, it's delicious. And, in, and by the way, it is totally delicious. <laughs> <laughs> the food, the, the the treatment is lovely. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and that that for us, I mean, our theory is, if we change the grassroots, if we have hordes of angry type two diabetics going to their doctors and saying, "This is how I'm." I'm going backwards in my diabetes. My diabetes is reversing. This is what I'm doing. Hopefully that will be a, a ground up 
change rather than trying to convince uh, a, a top-down approach. And we're certainly latecomers to the game. I mean, you know, our podcast yeah. started just, uh, you know, in 2016, but, you know, there have been people out there banging this drum for years and years and years. Jimmy Moore comes to mind. He's been great mm-hmm. to further the information and knowledge about low-carb. Totally. Dr. Atkins and Eric Westman. I mean, there's been a there's been a lot of people that have done that. Well, this is the thing, and it's just, why wouldn't you want to? You know, I go to the gym now, and I see these obese people working out in the gym, and they're working hard, and they're sweating, and they clearly have an enormous amount of willpower. Yeah. And Mm. I want to say to them, you know, I think I can help. Maybe you've already Uh, understood the right way. Maybe you're 100 pounds lighter than you used to be. I don't know. That's one of the issues. Or maybe you're one of the few people whom, you know, weight loss, even on a very low-carb diet. And we don't know, when I say few people, we don't know how few that is. But maybe it doesn't work for you. But if you've never heard of it, or you never... I can help. And you you can't say it. You can't walk up to strangers and say, you know. It's very hard. I Um, I can't do that cold open. Yeah. I carry business cards that basically say, you know, here's what I did. Here's what I looked like. And here's, you know, some information for you if you want it. And, And I find it very easy to just hand that to people and say, hey, you know, I think you need this. Well, this is away. what, again, talking to these physicians is fascinating and dietitians, um, mm. in part because I think diabetes is going to be the tipping point. It's like a homeostatic yeah. correction mechanism for oh, the yeah. bad science of the past 50 years. <laughs> yeah, <or so. laughs> that's a good way to put it. <laughs> It's one thing, you go on a low-carb diet, like you're 50 pounds overweight or you're 100 pounds overweight, you go on a low-carb diet, you got to give up beer and Coke and donuts and cake and Twinkies and, you know, French fries and pasta and all this stuff, and you lose 50 pounds, and your life is still pretty miserable. You don't like your husband or your job sucks or your... It doesn't solve everything. <laughs> yeah, right. And, may, and, and you're not, you don't go back, you don't go from being, you know, 45 and 100 pounds overweight to being 20 and living. You go 45 and only, say, 30 pounds overweight. So, it doesn't solve everything, but now you've given up all these wonderful things that you could sort of, um, you know, self-medicate with. And Mm. then your doctors say, oh, well, it's going to kill you, right? Because you're eating, you're eating... Drink right. saturated fat, man. That's going to kill you. The meat's going to get roof, dude. Yeah. So that that's issue number one, and that's their people. It's very easy to say this just isn't worth it. And then you fall off the wagon, you stay off the wagon. But yeah. if you're a type two diabetic and it's a choice between injecting insulin or not, you know, having a chronic disease or not. That's a yeah. different form. And now the risks, the, the sort of benefits and risks are different. And there's much more of a temptation to just want to be healthy and stay healthy. And for doctors, and again, I've, by the end of this month, I'll have spoken to about a hundred, interviewed about a hundred. You know, that, that's where it gets profound. That, I mean, getting people to lose weight is wonderful. Even 50 or a hundred pounds, you feel good about yourself, but you get them off. If you reverse their diabetes, it's like, that's almost a religious experience. That's not supposed to happen. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And again, this yeah. is what's fascinating is you think about, uh, you know, we have this understanding now that ulcers are caused by bacteria, right? And the guys right. who got the Nobel Prize Very from awesome. Australia, yeah. New Zealand, yeah, um, they, part of what they did was they drank a glass of, you know, water with bacteria in it to give (laughs) themselves an ulcer. (laughs) And you demonstrate something that the medical community doesn't think is supposed to happen, you win a Nobel Prize. In this field, with 50 years of cognitive dissonance, um, you do something and you get your patients to do it and you get hundreds, thousands to do it and demonstrate something that isn't supposed to happen. It's like, ah, well, it could have happened. They won't stay on those diets anyway or, you know, they're just eating less or it's just one rationalization after another. I like the uh, the advice from doctors that, oh, well, a ketogenic diet or a low-carb diet is too hard. And people can't stick to it. Oh, yeah? Well, how does that explain the potato diet? Come on now. <laughs> yeah. What's harder, eating ribeyes and eggs and bacon or reading nothing but potatoes? Yeah, this is I, a strange argument. But they have a – it's as though the, the community built up – it's got an immune system. 
and it's got right. this series yeah. of sort of like killer T cells and and and, and <laughs> immune responses to assure that anything that challenges this fundamental belief in a the sort of healthy diets, lean meats and fruits and vegetables and whole right. grains, and B, you know, you get fat and it's just it's all about calories. Anything that is even vaguely aimed at that belief, the immune system kicks in and one response that, well, you won't stay on the diet. It's too hard to stay on. It doesn't mean anything. You just eat less anyway. It's all yep. about eating less. You get right, so yeah. bored. Like, I know I would get bored eating, you know, ribeyes and, and, and salmon <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> eggs no. and bacon and <laughs> butter. And I mean, it yeah, just sounds terrible. like, geez, it sounds like French cooking without the potatoes. Right. Like, yeah. how boring can, anyway. Yeah. One thing about uh, one thing about the Barry Marshall incident with the H. pylori discovering that uh, it causes ulcers. The the previous treatment used to be radical surgery to 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 fix these people's ulcers. And after he had, was awarded the Nobel Prize and he'd proven that this bacteria caused uh, ulcers in the gut, we were still doing that operation for like ten or fifteen years afterwards. So after the science was already proven, right. mm. there was still this momentum involved, <laughs> mm. you know. So I think maybe that's our problem. <laughs> I've been thinking about this a lot, also, because again, you know, part of the goal of NUSI, the goal of NUSI was to fund research that we thought could resolve these issues. Yeah. But if you think about science, moves forward. The golden ages of science are invariably periods of science when the field is relatively small. And mm. the signal to noise ratio is large. So if somebody does a study, it's, it's meaningful. It's one of the few papers that might come out that month or that year on this field of science. Sure. And then there are invariably some very smart people who are determining or sort of leading the field and saying, this is important. This looks trivial. Right. This is inconsistent with that. We got to do this kind of research to make sure. Yeah. Let's say, get somebody to do this experiment to see which one of these two results is right. Um, nowadays, so I'm on a mailing list that comes out of, uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham. That's, uh, papers published each week in what they call obesity and energetics. And right. it's about 150 articles a week. So if wow. you think about it, if something that comes right. along, let's say NUSI, my not for profit, funds a study and it gets, but we'll call it the right answer for lack of yeah. a better term. And it's unconditional, unambiguous, and it's published this week in JAMA. Not only are there 150, 49 other articles published that week that all embrace the wrong paradigm, there's nice. probably, say, 10 weeks or 20 weeks of papers in the pipeline that were all yeah. written from the perspective of the wrong paradigm. Some of them have already been accepted. Most, many of them have been accepted for publication. Many of them are in proofreading. So if you go forward 10 weeks into the future and you mm. still have 1,500 articles that have been published embracing the wrong paradigm and right. one that's and one diamond <laughs> and one diamond yeah so one piece of wheat and 1499 <laughs> pieces of chaff, <laughs> chaff. Right. and now you have to expect that the community's smart enough so now you could go forward a year Mm -hmm. And some people are going to catch on that this changed the world, that this paper changed the world. But a lot of people are going to just do literature searches to see what right. they should sure, reference yeah. for their papers. And there's going to be several orders of magnitude, more articles published that year that are still the old paradigm. If you look at it from that perspective... Yeah. Science, when it gets this big, will never change. Just the vast yeah. amount of information that is available and the fact that it expires is just a, a, a problem doing any kind of internet searches for anything. Right. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. we're in the right. technology business, right, Richard and I. And so, you yeah. know, looking for stuff about some technology from Microsoft or from Google or whatever, you look at it and somebody's posted a blog post with code and all this stuff, but there's no date on it. Right. right. What? How, it's completely irrelevant. I can't use this because I can't put it in historical context, especially because this stuff changes so fast. I mean, recently, the Endocrine Society in the U.S. published their expert assessment. I forget how they named it of the cause of obesity. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting. It was kind of there's been all these people like me saying you guys don't get it. It's not about calories. Mm-mm. 
So they had to do their expert assessment, and they got the usual suspects who have been arguing one position for 30 or 40 years to write it, and lo and behold, what they said was that they were right all along. <laughs> and <laughs> why not? And then they actually addressed some of the arguments we made, but they addressed mm. them incorrectly, and they addressed <laughs> them using variations on the argument that in and of themselves were 20, 30, 40 years old. Sure. Because they've, it's just, it's this kind of self-perpetuating cycle. And the, the only problem is, you know, the famous line about science from, I think, was Max Planck, that science proceeds funeral by funeral, and the old oh, have to die off in order for a new generation to fully embrace the shift in scientific yeah. wisdom. But the problem in this field is that the old generation were pretty mediocre to poor scientists and they taught the younger generations to be poor <laughs> scientists yeah. so there's no culture of good science where people are going to say jesus we got to get rid of our uh, elders get them out of the way so we can do some good science here they all think they're doing good science yeah yeah since i've learned what i know now about the dangers of of making correlations and jumping to conclusions it's very hard for me to read any kind of book about just about anything without saying you know that doesn't prove anything do you, i just uh it's very hard yeah and i have the same problem now it's um Life is a lot easier when you believe people knew what they were doing. Yeah, um, right. And you <laughs> could just bliss. trust the expert. Yeah, but the association, um, I was just, this, yeah. yeah. Uh, what can you say? What can that's, I say? <laughs> yeah. That's it, yeah. Well, Gary, um, man, it's a pleasure talking to you and uh, just to, just hanging out. It's been a great, uh, a great almost hour. Well, thank you, guys. It has been fun. And uh, anytime. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. Well, wow. That was that was amazing, huh, Richard? Yeah, all I've got to say is we're not we're worthy. Not worthy. We're, we're not worthy. Not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Towns. I, know. I mean, I know. You, what's the chances that uh, you're going to get to speak to a man like that? Yeah, he's one of the people who is responsible for putting out the information that helped me find a ketogenic diet in the first yeah. place. And, yeah. you know, we spoke during the mail segment about paying it forward. Well, you know, this podcast that we're doing here, we're trying to pay it it forward for people like Gary Taubes who uh, right. got us motivated in the first place. Exactly. And it just keeps going and going and going. Well, Richard, are you hungry? Yeah, I kind of am. <laughs> All right, then. I guess we should share some <laughs> recipes. <laughs> you first. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to do aged beef steak. Aged beef? Now, yeah. do you mean letting it get funky and scraping off the funk? No, this is actually, this is more of a tip than a recipe, but okay. it's actually what I'm going to be eating tonight. So what you do is you buy some good beef. So what I'm using here is ribeyes from Costco. Mm. And these, uh, they're not top of the line. That would be the Wagyu. Um, mm. And they're not grass-fed and grass-finished. Mm -hmm. They're grass-fed and grain-finished. Okay. They're an Angus beef, but they're still right. a pretty good ribeye. So you want to look after these. You want to make these nicely. So um, what you can actually do is you can age them in a regular fridge. And aged beef has basically locks in the juice or locks in the juiciness of the of the beef and it just changes the the uh the quality of the of the, of the beef steak. And so what we do and this is a, a tip that I got from Jamie Oliver. Okay. I start with a regular pizza tray and on top of the pizza tray I put a rack. Now I use a rack. It's a circular rack on a circular tray. Um, it could be a rectangular rack on a circular doesn't tray. Matter, doesn't really yeah. matter. So what you want to do is you want to you want to put the, the the steaks on this rack and you put it in the fridge for three days. Now you can leave it a little bit longer if you need to. Um, what it does is it dehydrates the outer surface of the meat. So you're saying you don't cover it. You don't cover it. You don't put anything on it. You don't salt it, pepper it, or anything. You just okay. this is. This is raw meat okay. in the in the fridge. So you want to make sure that there's nothing else touching it. You want to put it on yeah, a shelf sure. by itself and so all, all those sort of uh, uh, precautions are necessary. But what we're trying to do here is we're trying to dehydrate the outer surface of the 
of the beef so that what it'll do is it'll seal in all the juices. And so, um, and you'll see that the, the steak will change colour over the three days. It'll get Yeah, it'll darker. get brown. Yeah, get browned, and then and then you cook it like you regularly would on a on a on a hot uh, cast iron uh, griddle, yeah. and uh, it's it's delicious. I suggest uh, trying it with a fresh one and the aged one, and doing an AB comparison, and see if you notice a difference. I have always known that putting a ribeye in the fridge, not mm-hmm. air drying it like that, but just leaving it in there for a week, right. makes it so much better. And yes, it's going to be brown. But yeah, I mean, it has more mm, uh, umami, more juiciness, yeah, it, and juiciness. But it also has more umami. I mean, mm. it, it's sort of mm, yeah. Well, it ages, right? I mean, aged beef has a a little funk to it. Yeah. Now it's not going to kill you because mm-hmm. guess what? You cook it. Yes, exactly. And when you cook meat, all of the bacteria dies. But you know, sometimes the the funkiness of it will still remain, you know, the flavor mm-hmm. of it. This yeah. is one of the reasons I think that pepper became such a popular condiment. And I've talked about this before on the show, I think, mm. is that, yeah, you you cook meat, but if it's older or if it's turning or whatever, pepper kind of masks the funk. Right. It does it. Anyway, bit, yeah. I, I'm yeah. a firm believer in that. So I'm going to try yeah. it. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. and uh, he doesn't recommend going longer than three days. Well, he says do it for three days, but I have certainly done it for a week and it's quite fine. Yeah. So, um, and in fact, uh, I've got two large uh, steaks in the fridge today. Uh, we're recording this on a Saturday afternoon in Australia. And on Sunday, I'm going for a bike ride. I'm going to eat, well, Julie and I are going to share one of those steaks. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to fast for two days, uh, maybe nice. even three days. And then we're going to come back and get the second one. Uh, after that uh, process, so um, you know it's it's already been in there for almost four days now. So by the wow. time we get to that second one, it'll have been there a week. It'll be fine. Sure, sure will. One of the things about uh, bacteria is bacteria doesn't get inside the muscle, um, mm. and this is why uh, with if you're going to sear the whole outside of the of a of a steak, um, you can eat the inside almost raw. That's mm. that's not a problem. Um, you can't do the same with minced meat because yeah. um, the bacteria can get on the the inner surfaces that yep, yep. Uh, they're in the yep. mint. So, but as um, long as you, you cook know, it up to temperature, you're fine. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So that's my recipe. What's yours? Well, um, this is a recipe that I've been making in the non-keto world pretty much mm-hmm. for years and years, but I ketified it. Okay. And it's keto lamb stew. Ooh, I like lamb, and it's springtime in Australia right now, and there's yeah. plenty of lamb. And it's autumn in the United States, and that's a perfect time to make stews. I <laughs> think I already talked about my beef stew recipe. Yeah. But lamb stew is, is the same kind of thing, but uh, mm-hmm. you start with a stock from bones. This one, you know, most people, when they think of stew, they think of stew meat, you know, stuff that is tough, you know, that you right. wouldn't necessarily want to cook and eat, uh, and you want to do it low and slow. However- mm. I like to buy lamb chops and use Ooh. those. Now, here's why. Yeah. Lamb chops obviously have the bone. And mm. you can get those French cut rack of lambs where you yep. can just slice off the chops into individual things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can either do that or you can get, you know, just lamb chops already cut or both. Now, mm. what you do is there's like a little circle of meat attached to the bone, right? Yeah. That's the loin, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. You mm. cut out that circle of meat. And set it aside and take all the bones. And for me, I think I had 12 or 15 bones. Mm -hmm. And I put them in cast iron with nothing but salt. I just salt them and put them in cast iron, put them in a 400 degree oven for 20 to 30 minutes. Right. And, And I flip them halfway over. Yeah. Make sure it's all seared around. Yeah. Yeah. They get a really nice crust on them. Now, when they come out, you're going to essentially put those in a pressure cooker or an Instapot mm-hmm. and make stock out of it. But before you do, guess what? It's, it's lollipop time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those are going to be the tastiest lollipops you've ever eaten in your life. So, okay. go ahead. You don't need all the all the fat that's on them. You don't need all the meat that's on them in order to make stock. So, just gnaw them off. And guess what? We were talking about bacteria. Oh, that's gross. That's bacteria. But yes, you're making stock out of it. So there's going yeah. to be no bacteria left when those things are done. 
Yeah. <laughs> so to make stock, you take mm-hmm. all the bones that you've just gnawed off. Yeah. <laughs> and you put them in your Instapot with, this is very important, garlic and rosemary. <laughs> oh, lamb loves garlic and rosemary. It sure does. And I took a whole bulb of garlic and mm. just crushed it up with my hands and threw it in there. You know, skins and all, it doesn't really matter. Nah. You're going to be straining it all anyway. You're going to be straining it all, yeah. Several sprigs of rosemary. Um, mm-hmm. That's up to you how much you want, but I like a lot of rosemary. I mean, I, it really, really makes it. Some cracked pepper. Maybe you want to chop up an onion because onion mm-hmm. brings out the umami flavor. Yeah, and nice. salt. Uh, you know, you want to go light on the salt when you're making stock because you're not sure how much you're going to end up with, right? So you mm-hmm. could even keep the salt out of it. I do. I keep the salt out of it when I'm making stock. Yeah. And then you pressure cook that for two cycles of one hour each. Right. That's yeah. pretty much my standard for making stock too. Two hours in an Instapot. Yep. So now you take all that, you strain it out, and now you're now you're going to reduce it. So you put it in a, a pot or a soup bowl or a soup pot on the stove. Mm-hmm. And you bring it down to about half of, you know, what it was before. Reduced by half, yep. Yep. And now it's time to start making the stew. So while that is reducing, you cut up your lamb into cubes, or you could do that at the beginning. It doesn't matter. Cut Mm -hmm. up your lamb into cubes. You set that aside. And you're going to take a small can of tomato paste Mm -hmm. and another bulb of garlic, maybe half a bulb, so maybe Mm -hmm. three or four cloves, and two or three anchovies. In oh, yeah. oil. Yeah. Yeah. So take two or three anchovies in oil, and you're going to mix all this stuff, you know, crush the garlic, mix the tomato paste, the anchovies, and the and the garlic together to make a paste. So this time you're going to peel the garlic, right? Yeah. This time I'm peeling and crushing the garlic. Yeah, you can't put the skins in, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. So now heat up a cast iron skillet yep. with some olive oil in there, maybe a tablespoon just to coat the bottom. And now I'm salting and frying up my lamb bits. Mm. And when those are browned after about eight minutes, Mm -hmm. you put in this uh, tomato paste, anchovy, garlic mixture, making sure your anchovies are nice and cut up, right? Mm. And then that coats all of those, all of that meat. Then I take a cup of red wine. And I like to use a Pinot Noir or a Cabernet or whatever you want, just a cup of nice, bold red wine, and put that on there and deglaze the pan, you know, get it all, get all those bits off the bottom. Get all of the, the fond off the bottom, yeah. Yeah. And you dump the whole thing into the stock. Mm. Okay? Now, your stock should be really rich because when those lamb bones came out of the oven, there was a lot of rendered fat, hopefully. You're mm. just going to pour that right in to the yeah, stock that's, when you- It's going to emulsify. It's going to thicken it all up. It's going to thicken it all up. Exactly. Mm. Okay. So now you have your meat in the stock and the tomato paste and a cup of wine. Now you need to put that on low and go away for an hour. Just walk away. Yeah. All right? Let it develop. Yeah. Let it develop. You can cover mm-hmm. it because you don't want it to evaporate further because you've already mm-hmm. reduced it by a half, but you need to slowly cook that lamb, the loin, in- the stock. Mm. Now you're ready to uh, bring in some butter and heavy cream, half a stick of butter, a cup of heavy cream, and salt and pepper to taste. This is a point where if you need to add more rosemary, you can do that, some fresh rosemary. Right. Yeah. And uh, you're, you're essentially just going to let that develop. Now, time to thicken it. Guess what we're thickening with? Let's Xanthan see. gum. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Now, the trick with xanthan gum, as I've said before, is you need to turn the heat off. You need to let the rolling boil go down and let it sit off the heat for about, I don't know, a minute or two. Mm -hmm. And then you just, as you're stirring with a whisk, you lightly sprinkle xanthan gum in there. And it's probably going to take about a teaspoon, maybe two teaspoons of xanthan gum. Mm -hmm. And now... uh. As long as it's as you're stirring and it's all in there, now you can bring the heat back up and bring it to a boil, and that really thickens the xanthan gum. Once it's boiling, t- 
turn it back down to low, and now you can simmer it for as long as you need to and serve it. Yum, uh, I, yum, I'm yum, just yum, thinking yum. about the flavors right now. This oh, yeah. has had so much opportunity to develop. Yep. That's, i, I got to try that. Mm. Yeah. Now, if you like other vegetables that you want to throw in there, you could do that at the point mm-hmm. where you add the lamb and let it cook down. You know, we're talking celery is always a good one. Yeah. Um, it's maybe some pearl onions, mm-hmm. you know, vegetables like that. Maybe, I don't know, you can think of any other vegetables, Richard. Yeah, I would think with lamb, something something low carb. Uh, you don't want to use too many root vegetables, but yeah. parsnip is pretty low carb. Yeah, um, yeah. you could also make. Uh, you could use uh, florets of cauliflower. Oh, um, sure. So both of those would work really well. In fact, florets of cauliflower you can you can poach beforehand and throw them in like dumplings, which is yeah. also delicious. Yeah, yeah. Or you could you know broil them with oil, mm. like I do. You know, put yeah. them under a broiler and get them all brown and crispy. Oh, yeah. Or your Brussels sprouts. Brussels, Brussels sprouts, sprouts, so sure. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, now, I, that's what, now that's I'm That's inspired. how we do the – that's the keto <laughs> version of pumpkin spice right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm actually, I'm actually going to do that. I've got uh, uh, some steak to eat first, and yeah. then I'm probably going to do some lamb pretty soon too. Very good. Well, that's a show, and what a show it was. Of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something that you don't agree with, some more research that you found to support or refute anything that we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or post it on our website. Yeah, and you can follow us on Twitter at Two Keto Dudes, on Instagram at Two Keto Dudes, and make sure to use the hashtag Two Keto Dudes. And of course, if you want to join the free ketogenic forum, it's forum.2keto.com. And if useless swag is your fancy, t-shirts, coffee mugs, and other junk with witty keto sayings on it, head over to gear.2keto.com. And if you want a shot at getting some of that swag for free, join the Two Keto Dudes fan club. You'll be eligible to win something in every show. Go to fanclub.2keto.com. And if you feel like supporting our now multiple podcasts and our forums, yeah. make a pledge on our Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com. And I should mention that the Patreon page is now paying fully for the Ketogenic Forums. So yes. uh, thank you very much. If you enjoy the Ketogenic Forums, uh, you can find all of our Patreons on the Ketogenic Forums. We've got a little Patreon badge on their profile and feel free to thank them. Definitely. Uh, you can also just hit the donate button on our website at www.2ketodudes.com or just go to donate.2keto.com. And you can also see our podcast and other mm-hmm. videos on YouTube at youtube.2keto.com. And if you haven't already, go leave us a review on iTunes. That's how people get to know us. Absolutely. Two Keto Dudes is brought to you by Two Keto LLC and produced by Pwop Productions, providing audio, video, and podcast production services since 2002, online at pwop.com. Well, keep calm and keto on, Richard. You keep calm and keto on, Carl. All right, and we'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes.